Hello, and welcome to Global Data Themes Instant Insights. At Global Data, we define a theme as something that keeps a CEO awake at night. As businesses that invest in important themes will succeed, and those that don't will fail. Hello and welcome to Instant Insights. I'm Emma Taylor and today I will be talking to Research Director Charlotte Dunlap and Service Director Rina Bhattacharya from Global Data Technology about generative AI, chat GPT, what it might mean for developers in the near future and also some general ethical considerations around this new technology. Well, thank you uh, so much, both of you for joining me today. Charlotte, we'll start with you. Uh, why why is chat GPT just such a big a big deal right now? Yeah, thanks, Emma. Um, chat GPT, I think it's such a big deal because it's the most advanced artificial intelligent chatbot technology that we've seen to date by leaps and bounds. So it was created by a company called OpenAI, which is based in San Francisco. It was just released in November. And just within the first week of the new release, it, it had over a million downloads. So I, I heard about it, I started reading articles on it, and it was just very intriguing to me. So I started reaching out to some developers I know to see how they were planning to use it. So as a bit of background, ChatGPT is a form of generative AI. Um, what is that exactly? Generative AI is this broader term to describe algorithms such as ChatGPT and Dolly 2 that's used to create new content, including images, video, text, and even code. Um, so most people know chatbots as those boxes that pop up and ask, hey, do you need any help on this website? And so Practically overnight, we've gone from bots asking if you have questions about a website to ones that are able to create, like I said, these digital works of art through natural language instructions, uh, writing technical papers and articles, and even writing computer code through various application programming. And how radical is this? Is this inherently a new thing? So, you know, to be clear, for years, there have already been large-scale deployments of machine learning, conducting really amazing high-productivity analytics across industries, things like medical imaging analysis. And my colleague, Rina Bhattacharya, she's been covering this space for years now. But what makes ChatGPT next-generation technology is its generative architecture that is pre-trained on massive amounts of text data. So it can produce human-like text in, in a you know broad range of contexts. Um, by the way, I borrowed some of that description from my recent blog <laughs> in which I had ChatGPT write my blog for me kind of as an experiment asking the bot how it improves the lives and careers of developers. And the upshot is it provided an adequate description of the technology and a use case for writing customer service apps. But, you know, Emma, I don't think the robot written blog really captured the essence of how these new coders will really find the most meaningful value from the technology. Yeah, it's so interesting. I will uh, put the link to Charlotte's blog in uh, the bio titled The New Age of Developers. So how do you think this technology could be of a benefit to, to developers? Yeah, right. Okay, so to me, what's most intriguing and encouraging is how this technology is really nicely positioned to help coders and non-coders alike in tackling some of the really tricky app modernization and app development in ways that they never could have before. Um, so I'll give you some examples based on some chats I've had with um, some of these developers looking into leveraging it. Um, new coders such as traditional systems admins that are looking to reinvent their careers are hoping to leverage ChatGPT to um, kind of bypass a lot of the cumbersome detailed coding requirements by automating the writing or converting of scripts, especially languages they're just not familiar with. So these new coders I've talked to, you know, these are guys, they're in the trenches of app development, 
they're working long hours on the weekends, um, you know, after they work their day jobs, just trying to, to learn these new things, trying to write some new applications, um, you know, figure out how to write Python scripts um, and spending hours of time, usually looking for answers on Google. So now they can rely on the chat bot to provide the base for scripts rather than Again, these kind of painstakingly research and writing those scripts themselves. So if ChatGPT can provide those basic lines of code, I mean, we're talking about hours and hours mm. of time saved. Yeah. So and furthermore, developers are finding they're even able to ask follow up questions of the chatbot. So if their original question just wasn't specific enough and the app's not doing exactly what they wanted, the, the chat bot is so advanced, it's intuitive enough to provide deeper context and go, go you know, deeper so developers can modify the code until they're happy with the outcome. And that's the kind of level of detail and interaction that illustrates how the new AI is. Yeah, I think from my experience with it, you have, you know, this whole thread of conversation with the bot that it also remembers. And also, like, the more specific you are with it, uh, and the more parameters that you give it, uh, the more you can get out, out of it. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm exactly kind of like having a conversation with it. In fact, the thing I was just going to add to Emma, I understand some developers have even figured out a way to put a voice on GPT through Siri. So now they can interact with the chatbot by using their voice assistant to ask it questions and have the answers read back to them. Wow, that's so funny. Yeah, it sounds, sounds like something out of sound fiction. Um, so yeah. I can imagine these these coding scenarios you've described yeah, that could play, play quite nicely into the whole tech reskilling movement. Yes, exactly right. Um, and that's a that's a really important topic that you're bringing up because, um, again, they're looking to further their careers. They want to stay relevant. They're looking for better employment opportunities. Um, but, you know, people don't always have time to go obtain a computer science degree or other advanced data science degrees. So this is the kind of technology that's going to help facilitate more low coders and non coders move into some advanced roles at their companies. Um, they're, you know, they're able to fill those roles by by shaving off time, consuming app development, by automating much of that app creation process. And so, um, yeah, in coming months uh, at Global Data, we're going to be writing a lot more about the new tech and developer reskilling opportunities and which vendors are investing in some of these new programs. So, um, but that's really important for helping developers advance and providing companies with these high productivity positions needed, you know, in this um, to, to improve their levels of customer service and, and find new business opportunities. Yeah, I think, yeah, the integration of this new technology into our like everyday working lives is going to be so interesting. Um, I did see that on um, that Stack Overflow had banned chat GPT um, answers from from their site because they were just like inundated with incorrect, not just incorrect code, but incorrect code that looked correct, which I thought was really interesting. But yeah, so Rina, wh why do you think there has been so much controversy and even like fear around uh, generative AI over the, especially over the past few months? You know, there's a lot of reasons for the fear and, and the controversy, but you know, in a nutshell, it's because it's good. It's good at tasks that we thought were so uniquely human that they couldn't be done well by a computer. And it's so, so impressively good that it's scary. And, you know, there's this fear of the unknown, um, you know, which is which is understandable. You know, we're impressed by what we've seen so far. And we've seen it used, like Charlotte said, to produce text, images, video, even art and music. But we don't know how it's going to be used in the future. You know, what we do know and what just about everyone that's familiar with it comprehends is that we've only seen the very tip of the iceberg and that there is so much more to come. And we worry, you know, we've seen AI applications that raise eyebrows because of the ways they could possibly be used. You know, there's the issue of deep fakes. Um, so, you know, to create images that seem real, but 
aren't, or, you know, there's natural language generation capabilities that can create voices and speaking styles that can mimic anyone. I mean, it could make you say anything. It can make me say anything. It could make politicians say anything. I mean, just use your imagination. You can come with a whole range of ways this could be used that are not for the public good. Yeah. Yeah. And it could have consequences, you know, for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. It impacts so, so many of us. It's not just a business application like predictive maintenance or, you know, sales forecasting or, or fault detection on an assembly line. You know, those AI applications are largely scenes. And this is something that kids are playing around with. And we see how students, you know, might use it and the impact on white collar jobs. And, you know, we don't know the specifics yet, but we do know there's a great deal of potential for it to have an impact on how we um, how we learn and how we work. Yeah. And how would you see the regulatory side of things developing in this area? You know, we've come to understand that a lot of times with emerging technologies, the regulatory environment plays catch up and mm. it doesn't keep up with the latest innovation. And this scares us also because we haven't quite figured out what the parameters should be. And then it, it's, you know, it's controversial because it, it ties back to bigger issues, which are hot topics right now, namely AI and ethics and responsible AI. You know, there are concerns over how AI can be used, you know, like you think about facial recognition or, um, you know, sentiment analysis or cognitive analytics, whatever it may be, um, you know, in what environments are we okay with those and, and when aren't we? So it's forced us to really think about the bigger picture. Yeah, for sure. So explainable AI is uh, obviously a really important trend at the moment. Uh, could you tell us a bit about that and whether uh, and how generative AI fits in fits in there? So explainable AI is about understanding why a model does what it does. So it's about identifying the factors that contribute to the outputs and actually, you know, quantifying how much influence those factors have. And then if you don't like how it's being done, you can actually tweak some of those, you know, say if there's bias in, in how it's being done. But the scary thing about generative AI is that, um, you know, we can't verify whether those outputs are true or false or, you know, where it's pulling that information. And, and on the one hand, um, we all know you can't believe everything you read on the internet, but with generative AI, the results are presented in a way that's so authoritative um, so, you, you don't know what is true, what is false, what's the source, is it real, um, how do we find out? So, you know, to be responsible, you really need to make models explainable. Mm, yeah, it'll be really interesting to see whether they add some uh, sort of explainability features soon. Sadly, that's all we've got time for. But thank you so much for those instant insights. Thanks for listening, and from us in thematic intelligence, see you next time.